be up here and not back in the audience taking notes. Um, just before the election, I wrote an article asking what it was that entrepreneurs needed from Washington. The short answer I gave was less. Um, but our panelists today may have a more productive agenda to discuss. And I know that, that there are many in the audience who are from Washington. I see uh, lots of uh, staffers. And that's great because uh, you'll be hearing from some actual uh, business owners and, and organize, uh, organizations that are interested in this topic to talk about really what the startup economy does and does not need from Washington. Uh, but before I introduce them, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Senator Jerry Moran of Kansas, who will provide some introductory remarks. Senator Moran, as many of you know, is a great friend of technology companies and a leader on entrepreneurship and innovation policy both in the Senate and then before 2010 during seven terms uh, in the House. Uh, Senator Moran successfully led opposition along with Senator Wyden, who we heard from earlier this morning, to defeat the Protect IP Act uh, earlier, uh, late la early in 2012. And the Protect IP Act was, of course, the Senate version of, of SOPA. He's also been very active in encouraging Congress to develop a uh, good spectrum policy as well. Senator Moran is the author of the Startup Act and the Startup Act 2.0. Uh, these are bipartisan bills that seek to unleash the job creating power of entrepreneurs to innovate, create, and grow the economy. Uh, the economy. So would you please uh, welcome Senator Moran to his very first CES. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, Larry, for uh, the introduction. Uh, thanks to our panelists. Uh, I'm anxious to, uh, to get your instructions, uh, hear your direction as to what uh, we should be uh, attempting to accomplish in our nation's capital. Uh, it is, in the, in the broad sense, uh, this ought to be, these ought to be issues that uh, don't divide us but uh, bring us together, and I hope that's the case uh, in uh, 2013. Uh, I very much appreciate the Consumer Electronics Association uh, hosting uh, this uh, tremendous trade show, and I've been able to wander the floor this morning uh, looking at the latest uh, ideas and uh, examples of innovation. It's, uh, what, what strikes me is that this is the area of our country's economy that has the greatest potential, is growing, uh, and has the most to offer as far as job creation, and it's the, the part of the country that, uh, it's the part of the economy that is um, hopefully least likely to be regulated and intruded upon uh, by what happens in Washington, D.C. Uh, it, it seems clear to me the evidence is that uh, with less government intervention, the likelihood of innovation, job creation, and economic success only increases. And uh, that is a, a, a concept that I think uh, needs to, to garner greater support uh, across the country. Uh, I got interested in this issue of entrepreneurship really as a, uh, as a frustrated uh, member of the United States Senate uh, only uh, a, a short time into, into my time in, in Washington, D.C. as a senator, um, it became clear to me that we were accomplishing so little. Uh, one of the motivating factors for my interest in, in seeking office, seeking a United States Senate seat, uh, and continuing in, in public service was a belief that the fiscal condition of our country is, uh, is very challenging. It's creating uh, the circumstance in which our kids and grandkids have less of an opportunity to pursue the American dream than they otherwise would have, and yet I saw no real success on doing anything in regard to either revenue or reductions in spending. There's a long litany of things that would show that that was not taking place from the President's budget to the Gang of Six failure to the uh, raising the debt ceiling and creating the, the, the special, the select committee. No real evidence that we were able to achieve something that I thought was very important. And while I haven't walked away from those issues, not at all, uh, I did reach the conclusion that maybe there's a different approach to getting our country out of the fiscal condition that it's in, and that's called growing the economy. Uh, job creation uh, creates that opportunity for additional tax revenues to be collected and the debt to, to be reduced. And so at about that time, a report from the Kauffman Foundation in Kansas City, uh, the Kauffman Foundation is devoted to entrepreneurship. Uh, that report landed on my desk with specific policy recommendations about what uh, Washington, D.C. might do in order to enhance the chances that uh, the United States uh, is and would remain uh, a country of entrepreneurs. Uh, and it, we took those ideas and, and began the process of drafting legislation. At about that time, uh, Senator Wyden introduced himself to me on the Senate floor and said, I've got an issue that uh, might be of interest to you. 
and would you care to team up with me? And we spent uh, a, a short amount of time analyzing the issue of SOPA and PIPA uh, and realizing that uh, most of the entrepreneurship and innovation, the, the job growth and the additional revenues to our treasury that was occurring in our country's economy were occurring because of the innovation of the technology sector within innovation. And certainly startup companies can be from the person who decides they want to open a, a, a dry cleaners on the corner uh, to uh, the, the latest in technology that originates and we see here at this trade show. But where the greatest success seems to me to be occurring was in that innovation uh, arena, uh, that technology arena. And uh, it appeared to me that government was about to make a decision that was going to limit uh, the opportunity that, uh, that that innovation was going to have for the economy. And so we became Senator Wyden's uh, Republican counterpart in opposing SOPA and PIPA. Didn't expect to have uh, much success. The, uh, the allies, uh, those who were allied uh, on the other side of this issue were significant, uh, significant players in our nation's capital, both uh, in Congress and uh, outside. Uh, and uh, while if Senator Wyden was in the room, I would give him full credit for the success, the reality is that it was the the community that decided that they were going to participate uh, in making their position known and heard and felt in Washington, D.C. And as a result, um, what was unexpected uh, became the, the outcome, the unexpected outcome of stopping SOPA and PIPA, at least at this point in time, uh, was uh, the success that we had as a result of citizen participation. And I hope, if, if, among other things that comes from that, uh, at least that uh, victory to, to this date uh, is a sense by those who participated in the process that democracy is still alive and well and a person's point of view can be heard and can, they can make a difference uh, because that outcome was certainly, the, the expectation would have been a different one than what we had. So that lent itself to uh, an, another aspect of, of innovation, but my interest in the topic really was um, Evolved around a belief that uh, technology is the, a great opportunity for us to grow the economy. I happen to serve on the Appropriations Committee in the Senate and am the ranking Republican on the committee that has the uh, uh, FEC's, uh, I'm sorry, the FCC's budget. Uh, and about that time, spectrum issues uh, arose and we began to understand the value of additional spectrum. Uh, and it was one more piece of the puzzle as to growing a, uh, entrepreneurship, particularly in the technology world. And so um, it was uh, no grand design about my arrival in the United States Senate, but it was this belief that we ought to grow the economy that resulted in reading the report from the Kauffman Foundation, listening to uh, Senator Wyden, and uh, realizing that uh, spectrum was an important issue. And I had a, because of my position, had an opportunity to influence uh, perhaps the decisions that the FCC would make and that my colleagues in Congress would pursue. Um, in that position, uh, on that same subcommittee, we got interested in the Jobs Act, and it's very discouraging to see that uh, so little has come from the passage of that legislation. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's discouraging because uh, it's an example of where we all came together. Republicans, Democrats, President, Congress passed a piece of legislation that I think has significant potential to uh, help grow the economy and to, to uh, raise the capital necessary for startup businesses. but. We've been unable, uh, or at least to date so far, the, the SEC has not finalized its rules in regard to its implementation. And that would be front and center uh, topic of conversation for me. I expect to be on that same subcommittee as the ranking Republican. Uh, as a result of the election, I will not be the chairman of that subcommittee, but will continue to be the ranking Republican where we hope to influence not only the FCC, but now the SEC to make decisions that are beneficial to raising the capital necessary for entrepreneurship. Let me just highlight the, the Startup Act, now called Startup 2.0. Uh, when uh, we developed the, the legislation, we knew that it was important to have bipartisan support. Uh, our first uh, choice uh, for a colleague to champion this cause uh, was Senator Mark Warner of Virginia, himself an entrepreneur. Uh, we made the case uh, for this kind of legislation and we worked out uh, differences between uh, what he thought the bill should say and what I thought the bill should say reached an agreement and introduced the bill. Uh, then we wanted to broaden its uh, support and reached out to uh, Marco Rubio, a Republican senator from Florida, and Chris Coons, a Democrat senator from Delaware, uh, who had introduced uh, legislation related to, to business issues. Uh, and we brought some of their ideas in and expanded our group uh, to four. And so um, we are 
at a point in which uh, this legislation, uh, we, we need to get off the dime and we need to make certain that it is uh, a top agenda item for the 2013 in, in Washington, D.C. This legislation deals to some degree with access to capital in the tax code. It deals, uh, again, with uh, the regulatory environment. Uh, perhaps most importantly, it deals with the issue of the global battle for talent uh, and our insane policy in this country of educating uh, individuals uh, who have great talent, skill, and intellect, uh, and then telling them they have no opportunity to pursue those uh, careers and their dreams in the United States. Uh, also to recognize that many entrepreneurs, in fact, the statistics show the numbers uh, in a very dramatic way, many entrepreneurs are uh, first-generation Americans or early arrivals in our country. Uh, and uh, so there's two visa provisions in Startup 2.0 that uh, allow for a significant increase in the number of STEM visas, uh, but also for those who are willing to, who are foreign born, but who are entrepreneurs and want to create business in the United States. Uh, in addition to that, um, uh, we believe that uh, having some competition among states through information and knowledge will increase the opportunity for entrepreneurs to decide where best they can uh, start uh, a, uh, with a new idea and begin a company. Um, and so this legislation, my goal is and I, to tie this together is what I hope is that what we learn from the, uh, the community's efforts in regard to SOAP and PIPA, in which they clearly demonstrated they have the ability to stop legislation from occurring, uh, I would love to see the circumstance in which they have the ability to promote legislation to see that it is uh, a pass. And again, we're, we're taking the approach that this legislation is not perfect. Uh, seeking input from you and others here. I've been to South by Southwest, I've been to Silicon Valley, uh, increasing the level of information about our legislation and seeking input from those who can help us improve it. But uh, ultimately the goal is to have those people buy into legislation and to use the same tools and techniques that uh, demonstrated the political power of the internet to stop bad legislation to demonstrate that there is political power in the internet to promote positive legislation. Um, and just to, to try to summarize, this matters because we are losing the battle for uh, entrepreneurship. It was very sad to me to have a, a, a business person in my office who travels the world uh, to tell me that the American dream is alive and well around the globe, but that the American dream is more likely to be pursued someplace outside the United States of America. And in fact, in the, sh in the two years uh, that I've been a member of the United States Senate, seven countries have changed their laws uh, where we have not uh, to, to try to create the circumstance in which they, to, to create the circumstance in which they are more likely to attract new business, startups, and entrepreneurs, including in the global battle for talent. The, that list of, of seven countries, uh, one of those countries is Chile. Uh, and one of the disturbing facts to me is that 20% of the companies that they promote to start up a business in Chile are U.S. companies who've decided it's better to pursue that entrepreneurship, that startup business uh, in Chile than it is in their home country. So this, in, in my view, is, uh, is just the basics of what uh, uh, we ought to be doing in which we create an environment in which those who have an idea, who want to pursue that idea with the hope of success, uh, have the ability to do that uh, and are not damaged uh, by doing it in the United States. And in some instances, we hope that they will be rewarded by doing it in the United States. Uh, and I'm very interested in seeing what uh, the panelists today say that the 2013 agenda should be for uh, the new Congress and uh, pledge to the, the startup community as well as those involved in technology a willingness on my part to be educated, to learn, uh, to listen and to try to make certain that the decisions that uh, I make in Washington, D.C. Uh, promote the idea of uh, a free market system that allows all Americans to pursue the American dream in the United States of America. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you for your interest in this topic. Well, that was a great uh, introduction. Thank you very much, Senator Moran. And Senator's going to stay with us uh, and, uh, and listen, as he does so well. What I've asked the panelists to do is uh, to uh, each give us a brief introduction of who they are and particularly what organization they represent. And from there, we have a number of topics we want to cover that are uh, some overlap and some are unique to their different uh, organizations. So let me start with you, Christian. Okay. 
Um, oh, okay, this mic. Thank you. My name is Christian Dawson, and I am from the internet. Uh, well, a lot of us use the internet. We all use the internet every day, but uh, I get to say that me and my team actually created a little pocket of it. Um, we're all entrepreneurs up here, but unlike the rest of the guys, I'm not a startup. Uh, what I do enables startups. It gives them a platform on which to uh, build their dreams uh, and, and generate economy. Um, I am a web host. My, uh, my company is called Servant, uh, and we've been around for 17 years, very much not a startup. Um, so. Uh, web hosting is a part of the internet infrastructure community. In fact, we put together a trade association of which I'm a part called the I2 Coalition. Uh, and um, we're talking about web hosts, we're talking about uh, registry, registrars, data centers, cloud providers, the guys that make up the nuts and bolts of the internet that sit atop the telco infrastructure. Um, and there are 30,000 companies like ours worldwide. We're mostly uh, small to medium businesses. Um, most people think that the internet is Amazon, Google, Microsoft, um, uh, Apple. It, it's, those are the exceptions. The rule is mostly small businesses, small businesses that are empowering small businesses. Um, we haven't traditionally had a seat at the table, and so one of our goals is to try and be a part of the process so that we can uh, engage, um, as we have in the past with uh, um, Senator Moran. Um, so that's why we're here. All right. Hello, how's everybody doing today? Good, good. My name is Hodge Fleming, and I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and I run a couple of startups. One is called GoKit, but I spend most of my day working on something called Brandcamp University. And what we truly do is that we help entrepreneurs and startups to be able to leverage technology to be able to tell their stories online. Uh, so just to give you just a little background about me, um, I had the opportunity to be a part of CNN's Black in America for the new Silicon Valley. Um, with Soledad O'Brien. And what that really did is that it really opened up my eyes to this whole startup ecosystem and how this world really works. So the perspective that I really want to bring today is really how do cities and states kind of change their mindset from an, from an industrial perspective. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, and if you look at Detroit, Detroit is really changing. And how does a town that has historically been a factory town reinvent itself? How does it now integrate and try to create high growth jobs in a place where now we have to get the local government and we have to be able to get this entre entrepreneurial community working together. And if you really think about it, one of the things that I've really heard Brad Phil talk about, and I think he really nailed it on the head when he talked about leaders and feeders and talking about how entrepreneurs are going to be the ones that are going to lead the movement, but we need to have an infrastructure that is set with the feeding organizations, whether that's government and universities working together so that we can not only create an ecosystem but make sure that it is actually sustainable. So I'm excited about being with you today and I look forward to an engaging conversation. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Rama Katkar and my company is called Hippity. Um, we're based in San Francisco, California. And we are a retail data analytics company. So we're one of the very small companies that Christian mentioned. We're only about six employees right now, and we're growing very rapidly. Um, our company does a lot of work with national retailers and also some professional services organizations, aggregating data and building technologies around predictive technology in terms of when sales happen, thinking through um, algorithms in terms of how can we predict when sales will happen in the future and how do we sell that to different parties. And one of the big um, areas of concern for a company like ours and many companies of our size and scale in the Valley is access to talent. So I'm obviously, my parents are immigrants. Um, it's something that speaks, that you know, is very near to me uh, personally. Um, as I see my, many of my family members go through this process of trying to get a visa and trying to get a job. And really um, being able to work, uh, be an entrepreneur or work in a smaller company um, and have the ability to do that in the US. So that's a topic that's of great interest to me and I think some of the other panelists here uh, and I look forward to chatting with you about it. Jake Siegel, also from Detroit. Uh, our company's Livia. We get apps on your smartphone safely into the dashboard. And uh, I started my business in 2008 uh, with a, a fresh set of business cards and uh, started handing them out and tried to figure out what I wanted to do. And five years later, we've got 20 jobs in the Detroit area and we work with uh, major car companies getting apps into their dashboards, which is great. 
Uh, I'm a little bit different on the panel. I usually keep my head down, and I try to avoid anything that isn't involving sales and closing deals. But I, I do have a lot of struggles when it comes to hiring folks, and I'm happy to talk about that. And I've also been through the ranks with angel financing, VC financing, as well as convertible debt financing and venture debt financing. So I've kind of been through it, and I understand the challenges that, that young businesses go through because I've, I've been there. But I definitely keep my head down when it comes to Washington and, and just really focus on the things that matter to, you know, make payroll every month. Thanks. And last but not least, Evan. There we go. Um, first off, I, uh, thank you very much, Senator, for opening this up. And um, the, the JOBS Act really is a remarkable piece of legislation and a remarkable accomplishment. And I think making sure that this community can really support the work you're doing to make sure that's implemented in the right way, I think, is, is critical to, to capital raising for a lot of startups. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Evan Burfield. I'm the chairman of Startup DC, which is part of the uh, Startup America network. Um, serial entrepreneur. Uh, launched my first company when I was 19 and have raised capital in a variety of different ways. And, hired lots of different people in lots of different fashions. Um, from a Startup DC perspective, we're really focused on what we can do within the Washington DC startup ecosystem uh, to really bridge the gap between um, startup-led innovation and a lot of the, the knowledge and expertise and connections that exist within, within Washington DC. Um, so there's sort of the, the first do no harm aspect of it, which I think is very important, but then there's also a, a broader view that uh, one of the biggest opportunities for innovation that our country is looking at over the next decade is how do we reinvent the way we educate our kids or provide health to our uh, citizens or um, drive energy efficiency and manage transportation. These are big complex issues and these are issues in which we have a significant amount of opportunity to kind of disrupt um, and innovate. I think uh, the leadership for a lot of that is going to come from startups, but those startups need to be able to understand how to actually connect and engage in these regulatory uh, environments in order to be able to drive that innovation. And that's a, a lot of the stuff that we're doing in 2013 is focused on creating that community. Great, thank you. Well, let's, let's get right into uh, some of the meaty topics. I mean, we've already heard uh, yesterday and today about some of these before in terms of uh, immigration, patent reform, uh, but, uh, but let's talk about it from the standpoint of people who are actually in the trenches. Um, let me start with you, Christian. Give us a sense of, you know, kind of a framework that you think startups would like when Washington thinks about regulating or not regulating, what are sort of some of the guiding principles from your standpoint you think ought to be included? Well, I actually made you guys a, a short, broad list that I'm going to re read to you in a minute. But first, I want to go even broader and basically say that, um, well, remember when that guy Columbus discovered that new continent, or at least from a European perspective? The internet's kind of the biggest thing since then. and and we need to realize that old ways of approaching legislation just aren't going to work. The first thing we need to do is get to Congress to acknowledge that nobody owns the internet, nobody controls the internet, and attempts to do it are gonna generally fail. Uh, people don't understand how vast and multifaceted the internet is. It's not like telephone lines. Uh, no one group will ever have enough of a singular perspective to understand it enough to legislate it in full. Um, there are existing methods to help shape and grow the internet. It's called the multi-stakeholder process. Uh, groups like ICANN, WWWC, IETF, ISOC, they take aspects of the internet and they bring stakeholders to the table with differing perspectives. Enterprise, governments, content creator, creator um, users, internet providers like me all come to the table and they hash out all the different perspectives and the relevancy uh, basically, you need to do good works for you to be paid attention to. Um, uh, what the government can touch and control, uh, th they need to understand that it's actually very limited. Um, ultimately, I'll, I'll go ahead and read my list here. Um, so, I, we want, any regulation should be placed with agencies who currently have specialized expertise in the area sought to be regulated. For instance, the FTC has some internet experience and they listen to us. So the FTC is somebody who we may want to talk to. The SEC has effectively dealt with online stock fraud. Um, so yes, they, uh, we don't want an internet agency. We don't want an internet czar. <laughs> um, the current multi-stakeholder process should be respected and the government should take steps to reinforce that when working with multi-stakeholder entities or considering legislations or activity that would undermine it. Uh, like the domain name seizures severely undercuts the multi-stakeholder process. It really hurts us. 
we don't want people to keep sticking failed domain policy initiatives into treaty negotiations, like the TPP. Uh, we want continued support for the Communications Decency Act. We don't want the creation of blacklists and whitelists. Ultimately, any regulation should continue to be technology, ne technology neutral, and any regulation should expressly and broadly preempt state uh, regulation. Right now, we've got a Swiss cheese mess of, uh, of state regulations that's impossible to wade through. Um, we also need to use language that is explicit and easy to follow. That's another problem uh, with a lot of these bills where we just don't understand what it is you're talking about. And if we don't understand what you're talking about, then we can't even tell you whether we're pro or con. Um, at, at the end of the day, here's what legislators need to realize. When we're focused on copyright, on privacy, on security, any other issue, the U.S. isn't the only game in town. You know, I, as a web hosting provider, I lose business every day to overseas. Um, right now, our industry represents a trade surplus. More people are coming to do hosting in the United States uh, to build their businesses on our infrastructure than the reverse. But we still lose it because people uh, outside this country use, for instance, um, the Patriot Act against us and say, well, because of those uh, regulations, I can't possibly be hosted in the United States. And um, the more restrictive legislation we put on our soil, the more people are going to take their businesses and they're going to start them on everybody else's infrastructure. And uh, losing infrastructure to overseas due to excess regulation is a gateway to losing innovation altogether. Because if you go ahead and you say, well, I'm already hosted over in the Netherlands, well, now I can outsource this, now I can outsource that. that. Um, so we can prevent that with open dialogues and all seats at the table. Great. So that, those are some really good first principles. Anybody else uh, want to add to that list or, or disagree with any of those? Okay. Well, let me. So, so using that as kind of a framework, let's let's talk about some of the very specific uh, issues. And I'll start with the with Jake. You mentioned capital. Uh, uh, tell us about sort of you know what are some of the, the the problems or opportunities you have in terms of, of raising capital and where, where ways in which Washington can help by either doing less or doing more? Well, there's there's two issues I want to cover uh, when it comes to capital raising. The first one is that investors need to be free to put money into what they choose to, and providing um, any sort of barrier to doing so creates a problem. And that point number one for, and this is for angels, you know, these are affluent individuals that want to put money into companies that they understand. They need to be able to do that freely without any sort of penalty. The, the second issue is at a, um, really at a federal and a state level where, in my experience in, in Michigan, if you aren't making cars, then you're not getting funded. And, and that's changed quite a bit to add three more categories, that if you're not in cars or healthcare or advanced this, that, or the other, then you're not getting funded. And I just think that's wrong. I think that you need to look at this and say, well, you know, where is innovation going to happen? And, and you know, I mentioned earlier about Detroit. To get a new scene in Detroit specifically, you've got to think outside the box. And investors are highly qualified to do so. And putting limits on what they invest in or provide, by providing incentives on investing into special interests creates a problem. It's not, um, it's not what I would consider you know, a free market and allowing folks to invest in what's really going to make this country great again. Any, anybody else want to chime in on, on uh, funding issues? Okay. Well, let's so let's let's move on and and we might as well stick on the theme of Detroit, since by the way, I'm also originally from Detroit. I'm not <coughs> sure what what this panel ha has to do with it. But uh, let me come to you, Hodge, and ask um, your your Detroit company. Jake's got a Detroit company. What kinds of things do you experience, either pro or con, from sort of local government that uh, makes it easier or more difficult to kind of, you know, keep innovating outside of Silicon Valley. Okay, so if you look at if you look at a place like Detroit, we're going to have to. It's going to be harder for us to attract a Microsoft or or an Amazon to have a headquarters. I mean, I'm in Detroit, right? So so we're going to have to focus more on on what we will look at as being as being economic gardening. We're going to have to look at what are the what are the assets, what are the companies, what are the entrepreneurs that are that are in the community to create an environment so that they want to stay there. So now so I'll give a couple examples. So we have a couple of entrepreneurs who are doing some really good stuff. So we can look at someone like a Dan Gilbert. Dan Gilbert has purchased quite a few buildings, probably about 26.5 million square feet worth of commercial real estate in the city of Detroit. Um, and is doing some really cool things. 
and has been able to attract companies like Twitter and other companies. There's another gentleman by the name of Phil Cooley who purchased this building that was foreclosed on in a blighted part of Detroit, which was 30,000 square feet, and is now creating this, this collaborative workspace. So I think what has to happen if you look at a place like Detroit is that, is that, that local government has to, has to be able to support creating an environment for these entrepreneurs to be able to get together, to be able to collaborate, and to be able to create some really cool and interesting things. Um, and, so, and so that's how we're going to be able to move forward. Because one of the things to think about is that there's this multiplier effect that happens when you start to have this type of activity. Um, you start to have other businesses that grow around it. You start to attract other like-minded companies and entrepreneurs that are there. So I think that from our standpoint, we're not going to be able to look at the government at the federal level to be able to solve world peace for us, right? You know, so we're going to need to be able to do some things on a local level. And, and I'll close with this example. We had Coal for America come in town, um, and they worked with their local government. And they, and they worked on a couple projects. And I think, and I think some of the learnings that our local government learned is that, look, there are different ways to be able to solve problems that are a little more efficient. And so I think having those types of engagements really kind of shows our local government how they need to kind of change. Okay. And is there, I mean, is there anything specifically from Washington that would make this harder or easier? Um, I think, you know, there are quite a few, I would say different tax incentives, you know, and things that have come down. I think there are things that have come down from a federal level that have that have opened up opportunities for startups to be able to launch. Like there was something, and I can't remember what type of technology it was, but um, but there were certain kind of incentives that that you know, it was um, it was I think like the Icon battery or something like that. It was some kind of battery project, and what it did is that is that is that it caused an actual startup to be to be birthed in our in our market and to be able to stay there where we could utilize a lot of the intellectual capital, a lot of the access um, manufacturing facilities and things that used to be used for autom that used to be used for automotive that they can now be used for a different industry. Okay. Uh Anybody else outside of Silicon Valley who has uh, you know, issues or opportunities that, uh, that, that are relevant here? No, I think just to echo what was just said, um, you know, it's really interesting within Startup America because we get together every quarter and we get leaders from all of these different startup regions from across the country together. And the first kind of couple summits that we did like this, a, a set of issues kept coming up, right? So um, everybody was convinced, for example, that there was all this talent elsewhere in the country, and if they could just somehow convince that talent how to come to Detroit or come to Washington or come to Kansas, then they could have a really vibrant startup ecosystem. And the same thing with capital. They were all convinced that there were these venture firms someplace else, and there were these rich people someplace else, and if they could just get them to come to their community and start investing, they could start growing. And, and what was interesting, and I think it was sort of an aha moment, was getting all these people together and going, so everyone from, from Silicon Valley to New York to Kansas to Detroit are all convinced that the talent is elsewhere and the people that are ready to work in startups and all of that, if they can just sort of move it around. It, is, it, it was the revelation that this is not a, um, a zero-sum game. And, and it really shifted our focus, certainly within the DC ecosystem, of this isn't a war for talent within the US. It's about how do we develop and grow more of the skills and, and more of the um, cultural attributes that are really going to make people um, appropriate for these jobs that startups are creating. Same thing on the capital front. It's not about how do we sort of attract capital from other parts of the U.S. to somehow come to our region. It's about how do we create the right preconditions to enable the wealth that's, that's there in almost every community in America to actually start investing. I mean, in Washington, D.C., we have five of the seven wealthiest counties in America. Right? It certainly isn't an issue in Washington if we don't have rich people. It's a matter of we got to get our rich people to start investing less in restaurants and more in, in startups, right? Um, I think the, the area, though, where Washington can really help on that is exactly the one we've already highlighted. It's the JOBS Act. It's implementing the JOBS Act correctly, and it's enabling the removal of a lot of these regulations that make it more complex to do this, right? Um, I don't know that Washington is going to have a huge impact on how does every local community do a better job of training its talent to be appropriate for startups, but it can really impact that capital question. I, I don't think it's, it's, it's feasible or realistic to say there should be no barriers whatsoever on investors' ability to invest in these startups. I mean, I think like any issue like this, it's one of um, where does the pendulum fall, and the pendulum's fallen too far in one direction, which is we have way too much regulation, 
but I think we need to recognize that when engaging with the SEC around how these rules get written, that there do need to be some level of, of investor protection that's going to have to be in there, but it's making sure that there's an appreciation of the fact that this capital is really, really vital to growing startup ecosystems across the whole U.S., and that this is a central economic issue for us right now. Hmm. Let, let me actually ask you, Senator, um, what about in Kansas? What, what do you hear from entrepreneurs in Kansas as far as what they need or, or what makes it more difficult for them to stay in Kansas as opposed to Silicon Valley or, or other areas? Well, one of the things that I think is so impressive, so perhaps unique about the entrepreneur community, the startup community, is their willingness to help others. Uh, it's a, it's a, an unusual circumstance. We think of business as competitors. And what I see so often in Kansas, but across the country, but I see it in, in states like ours where we desperately want to develop this entrepreneurial climate, uh, it is the ability to uh, associate with others who have that mindset uh, and the willingness to be so unselfish in sharing your views and how to accomplish this and to share your investors and, and it just is a, it, it's a very appealing circumstance. It's one of the reasons I like all of you, not that you care whether <laughs> I like you or not, but it is this sense that there's something very special about what you do. You recognize it and you want to share it with so many others and the benefits to our country uh, are so significant when that occurs. And now I, I don't think it's uh, terribly different in Kansas than any other place. Um, one of the things that uh, we have uh, that, that is to our advantage in a, in a startup community is Google and their gigabit uh, efforts in Kansas City, uh, which creates a, an opportunity that would not otherwise exist. Uh, and our educational, our, our universities, our university system uh, is really seeing entrepreneurship in ways that they've never paid attention to it before. And so I think, it, like places across the country, uh, good things are happening, but in large part, you have the same challenges, particularly access to capital. I would guess if you ask Kansas startups, that would be their greatest, we don't have the, we need a greater set of, of, um, of investors uh, that exist in some places uh, in, in much more dominant ways than they do in our state. Well, I would love, I'll get back to you in a second, but it's, it's interesting because you, you mentioned the, the Google project and for those of you who don't know, you know, Google uh, asked communities to, to essentially submit applications to be a test bed for gigabit home ethernet service, uh, uh, internet service, <laughs> and they received over a thousand applications. They chose Kansas City, and one of the things I think is worth noting is that um, what they've said is that, for example, all the applications they got from California, where I live now, were essentially uh, dismissed because just of the environmental impact reporting requirements that they would have had to do. And so in some ways, local regulations that, that might be there for one purpose can actually, you know, in terms of infrastructure in particular, can, can, can uh, interfere with the new development. Yeah, Christian, you wanted to add something to that? Sure, I was, I was going to say that I had said before that there are 30,000 companies in the internet infrastructure space worldwide. One of the reasons why it is so fragmented is um, uh, there are a couple different reasons. One is you're talking about very narrow, specific types of technology. Uh, and the other is that a lot of this stuff is extremely localized. Um, you've got people that, it, it's, a, it's a high touch field because this technology is very complex. And you've got people in their local areas that are helping get startups off the ground, helping get businesses off the ground. It's one of the things that we get to do. Um, legal bills in the uh, internet infrastructure space tend to be relatively high. We run into a, a, a number of legal uh, um, addressing issues of tort reform, um, uh, specifically with regards to uh, addressing copyright trolls and patent trolls, uh, would certainly be something that would be helpful for us to be able to continue uh, to offer high-touch services to our business clients. Uh, Ram, I want to bring you back into the conversation now as well. What, what would you say are sort of is the most significant legal issue that, that you have to deal with as, a, as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I mean, I'd say from a legal perspective, there's a couple things. The first is um, the prohibitive cost of applying for patents. So we have um, a bunch of technologies that we're building, predictive technologies that we're building that I would like to apply for a patent for, but our situation is somewhat unique in that we don't have venture financing. We're trying to, we have a, we've raised a small round and we're bootstrapping. So I face a 
an issue every day where I have to think about what kind of resources do I want to put towards um, applying for a patent? When is the right time to do that? Um, and how do I protect the IP that I'm building? And so that's something that's um, a pretty pressing concern for us. And what, what would you see would be those sort of the most useful reform uh, that, that could to make that easier for, particularly for a smaller startup company? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the most useful reform on that would really be to make the process less expensive, um, to maybe have a, an interim process so that it's not a, um, there's a short-term process and then a longer-term process that there was a, a way to in, give, give uh, entrepreneurs some small protections around the IP that they're building um, in a less expensive way. And, and you know, that expense, it's, it's not just filing expense, it's legal expense. And that really adds up when you're thinking about, you know, should I be spending my time selling and should I be send, spending my time building my business or spending my time on legal bills? Okay. And so w one of the things that obviously, you know, is unique about startups is they don't have dedicated government relations staff. They don't have, in many cases, they don't have dedicated legal staff or full-time legal staff. And so even if there are available government services, they may have difficulty knowing about them or using them or, or even getting access to them. Evan, I think that's probably part of, of what, what you do. What, what can you tell us about sort of innovating in terms of use of government services or even just uh, just reconfiguring them? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, um, a major part of the challenge, right? It, it, as somebody who you know, lives in Washington and is part of multiple different communities, yes, obviously large corporations and large interests have, you know, tremendous access to be able to communicate and, and inform policymakers about how various issues are going to impact them in a way that startups simply don't because it's much more diffused. And I think SOAP and PIPA was, was one example of when there is an interest that sort of does represent an existential threat to those startups. It's amazing their ability to kind of come together and communicate, but, but outside of those kinds of exceptional cases, it's, it's very difficult. And there's groups like, um, you know, there's, there are new trade associations that are coming on board, and ones like the Association for Competitive Technology, they've been doing this for a while. Um, the Internet Association, which is just coming together, which are trying to tackle a lot of this. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it really becomes incumbent upon the startups to become more educated, more aware of the fact that these issues do matter. Um, you know, if you've interacted with our immigration system, if you've interacted with our patent system, if you've tried to read capital, it's, it's pretty clear to any rational person that these are pretty fucked systems right now. And we have to fix them as a country. Um, the issue is not is that the case? It's that you have a lot of gridlock in Washington and you have to sort of fight through a lot of the different stakeholder groups that have different perspectives on different sides of all these issues to get these fixed. What's much more interesting to me in the broader sense is really tapping into much more the essence of what Washington does. Um, you know, if you think about my life as a consumer, if you go walk around this show, right, my life as a consumer has become so wildly better in the last 10 or 15 years that it's almost mind-boggling, right? Like what I can do on my phone, the services that I can tap into, what I can access, who I can connect to, the information I have available to me. And, and it's almost unbelievable to think about what I didn't have available to me 10 years ago versus today. My life as a citizen is about as screwed as it was 30 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Our education system is still broken. You know, we spend 50% more on every student that we educate in the U.S., K through 12, than any other economy in the OECD, and we produce mediocre results. Our healthcare system spends twice as much per patient as any other healthcare system in the U.S. and produces bottom of the stack results versus the OECD. You know, we have huge issues with energy efficiency. Our political system, obviously, it was the very first issue the president addressed, right, and after he won the election, was we gotta fix our political system. Well, nothing's being done about that. The interesting part to me is there's these unbelievable startups out there that are doing incredibly cool things in all of these issues, and they don't perceive themselves as part of the public sector. They don't perceive themselves as um, engaging with Washington. They see themselves as fixing the problems that they see around them. How do I educate my kids? How do I drive health care? Right up until they have to figure out how they scale and make money and really grow this into a business. C can and you so give you us an example? Just to yeah, great. Um, you develop an education application that says, um, we're going to help K through 12 kids exchange content with each other and with tutors and teachers. It seems like a really cool solution. You start scaling it, and then all of a sudden you figure out, wait a second, I've got to deal with COPPA. And I've got to deal with an issue that restricts how I actually store that data and, how, and who I can share that data with if it's an under, a student under the age of 13. And this significantly complicates you know, my whole process. Or 
in healthcare. I mean, we advise healthcare startups all the time that have really cool patient-centric solutions, and then all of a sudden they start getting into these issues of, wait a second, you know, how do we deal with the payer system? How do we deal with Medicare coding? How do we deal with all of these really complex regulatory issues that make innovating in these spaces much more complex than innovating in the sort of more pure consumer world? But, but these regulated spaces are half of our economy, and they're the half of our economy that the, presents the really big problems for us as a country going forward. And, and that's a lot of what we're focused on, is how do, we, how do we actually tap into a lot of the expertise that Washington does have to really try to figure out how to empower these startups to drive this change. Yeah. Hmm. Any, anyone else want to? Yeah, go ahead, Jake. I've got a, a quick example. Um, I, I heard it mentioned earlier about technology agnostic legislation. And you know, I'm in the you know, radio business, and you know, right now there is a rate that Pandora pays for every song they play. But if you broadcast over FM radio, you don't have to pay that rate. And I think it might have made sense before my time, I'm 31, to have these types of rules, but I don't see how it's any different. I mean, how you're going to get your content, various sources should be playing by the same rules. So one thing I would add on top of that is technology agnostic legislation. So one, um, older technology or even potentially a newer technology doesn't have any benefits over, over an existing one. That's, that's one thing I'd like to see. Does, uh, does anyone on the panel have any sort of, you know, personal or, or business experience dealing with either, uh, a, you know, sort of a patent issue or with an immigration issue that, that might add some, some flesh to this conversation about it? Anyone? I got a real quick one. I've got three open jobs right now. I've had um, hundreds of people apply for it, and what we need is very highly specialized, and there just aren't that many people that have the cross that what we look for. And I've had to turn down three applicants that are great, that are you know educated in this country, they have advanced degrees in this country, but they happen to live out of this country, and I can't afford to sponsor their visa. Nor would I, by the time I, if I could have sponsored them, by the time I get them in here, I have no idea like if the job would still be available at that point. So and that's that's right now in my business and 20 jobs in Michigan. Robert? Yeah, I would. I mean, I would echo that. So you know, we have a situation where we've. Um, been working with students who we'd like to bring on full time, and it's not a possibility for us, and we can't sponsor their visas, and um, you know they're not U.S. citizens, so it's not it's not easy for them to stay in the country. Personally, you know, I have an experience where I have two cousins who are actually getting PhDs to stay in the country because they weren't able to get jobs that would actually sponsor visas for them to stay here, and they're, you know. I obviously am biased. I think they're very qualified and talented kids. But you know, one is the one that I would like to work. I would like to work with her in my company. But it's something that we can't we can't do right now. So I think there's um, I think everyone agrees that there's a need for reform there. I know there's a lot of work being done for reform there. But it's really disappointing when you see when you see these talented kids that um, you know you know you know they're talented. You work with them. You see their talent, and then you see them going back to their home country versus staying here and working here. And you know that's what they want to do, and that's what what a lot of companies want them to do. Yeah, Christian. With regards to the patent issue. Um uh, I have more experience with that. Uh, through my work with our uh, trade association, the I2 Coalition, I work with a number of different um, hosting providers. I can't really speak for them or give their examples, but we've worked, I, have, I have a number of things that I can think of off the top of my head uh, where uh, we've got patent troll situations, copyright troll situations, where if you use a modicum of common sense, you realize um, that there's no case here. But you take a situation where, in our industry, um, s a small business's profit, you know, for the entire year might end up being, you know, thirty-eight thousand dollars a year, and you can spend that on lawyers to fight a, a frivolous case in no time. Um, so we're looking at, you know, patent troll and copyright troll situations where we're, 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 um, we got guys settling. So to avoid you know, hundred thousand dollar, two hundred thousand dollar legal bills, you know, for ultimately what amounts to their entire profits for the year. Yeah. And we heard uh, for those of you who heard yesterday, we had a whole panel on uh, particularly on on patent litigation and sort of abuses of the patent system, and have talked about a, a bill that's been uh, I introduced by by Congressman DeFazio, who was here. Anyone else have any direct experience with the intellectual property issues or or you know sort of similar legal obstacles? Oh, good. You're, you're, you're lucky. <laughs> All right. Well, in the last few minutes, I wanted to, uh, to open it up to audience questions. And if you don't have some, I, we have uh, a number of topics we still haven't even gotten to. But I wanted to see what we've got in the audience. And I see a hand in the back. And I think a microphone is coming for you, sir, if you just wait a moment. Uh, Senator Moran, unfortunately, had to uh, leave for a meeting. But uh, we were grateful to have him as long as we did. Uh, hi. Jonathan Zook from the Association for Competitive Technology. I, th I thought I'd... Uh, 
bring a topic, topic up a little bit controversially just for fun because um, it's uh, lunchtime. And uh, I, there's all this talk about startups, barrier to entry, for example, and I wonder if startups are really the key to economic growth in the economy or barrier to entry is really the issue as much as barriers to growth. And, and, and I think there's a difference between growth and churn, which is the constant process of starting up and not moving beyond starting up. It's easy to start up, it's difficult to build a business. And what's increasingly a challenge, I think, in the context of the digital economy is asset creation. Uh, you know, de Tocqueville talked about this tyranny of the majority in which we commoditize everyone's assets in order to facilitate startups. So we, don't, we, want to, we want to commoditize IP, we want to commoditize content, we want to commoditize investments in infrastructure in order to facilitate everybody's lower barrier to entry. But are, are, we, are we a snake eating its own tail if we're ultimately eating up the assets that companies are trying to create, that create sales down the road, that create the next new startup, that incent venture capitalists to invest because they might get value back out. So I, I, I'd like to raise that question that um, is anybody as concerned as I am that we treat digital assets in too much of a cavalier fashion um, when they are in fact the only assets in the content. I mean, even, in, even users, which is, the, which is the new asset now, we're trying to come up with ways to make it easier for one company to take uh, the user base of another customer. So, so nothing becomes an asset that becomes a value proposition for the company, makes it sellable, ma allows that growth and that uh, 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 the, the positive churn to take place. Well, that's a good, so thank you. That was a very good question. I mean, how do some of you think about your assets in terms of information? How do you, how do you manage them? How do you, how do you build them? <laughs> um, anyway, go ahead. Well, I, I'm not quite sure how to address the question because I think about things slightly differently than, than that. Um, I, I, I want to tell a little bit of story. When I say that I work with companies, when I work with innovators uh, to help them build their businesses, I'll use an example. Um, many of you may know the company uh, Etsy, Etsy.com. I was lucky enough to be, uh, to work with them when they were getting off the ground, uh, help build their, their first series of servers, uh, work with them, they you know, showed me a demo and said, hey, what do you think about this, this idea that we've got? Um, Etsy, if you're not familiar with them, is this, um, is this company. They're like um, an eBay for handmade goods. And so you've got a situation where they're empowering through their technological platform uh, people all over the world uh, and specifically heavily targeted in, in, in rural America, um, areas that are generally uh, sort of underserved and underemployed uh, to build their own businesses. Uh, I'm not, I, I, I don't know how to answer your question because what I want is to find ways to build more of those types of companies. You know, I, I was able to help build a, um, a, a business that builds businesses, um, that creates that kind of economy, and I don't see that necessarily as, a, um, uh, as the snake eating his own, head and own tail. I see that as the internet empowering the world. Anybody else? Okay, uh, other questions? Yes, sir, right here. Mike's coming. Yeah, you finally, right at the end, touched on what's one thing I'm really interested in, which is the intellectual property that has, like never before in history, is a, is a significant factor in most startups nowadays, is, is there's intellectual property rights. And as you all know, for most of this country's history, uh, international treaties for us were like for existential factors like survival, like military treaties and so forth. We stayed out of burn for 80 years. Uh, now, almost everything we do is influenced, as far as domestic policy, is influenced by treaty obligations. Mm. And uh, so I'm wondering, uh, going forward with globalization and homogenization, which means that, that our, our ability to legislate is restricted uh, to some extent by by the policies that we've agreed on with other countries that don't have our innovative history. Uh, how, how is that future globalization going to impact our startup culture? Okay. Anyone want to take it? Yeah, Jake. Well, I can tell you that, you know, as a VC-backed company, I can afford to file patents, but I can't afford to fight them. And I can't afford, I can't afford to file them in the United States. I cannot afford to file them in the zillion other countries that I need to file them where, in a, in a, especially on the internet, you know, my competition can come from anywhere. 
So um, I, have a, I have a big problem with uh, patents as a product. That's something that it bothers me a lot, especially in the software world. Mm -hmm. But I think the, uh, as mentioned earlier in the panel, I think that you know, the cost of filing is one thing, but imagine trying to do a patent research and then you know, what does that really mean? So I put the value of my patents at pretty much zero. I mean, maybe someday if a larger entity had acquired my patents, maybe they'll have a different value to it. But I mean, it's almost like a number of patents is more valuable than the patent itself these days. Yeah, question over here. The mic's coming. Hello, my name is Oscar Menhibar. Um, I'm a, I have a startup, it's a nonprofit startup. Um, it's called Urban Teens Exploring Technology. And um, we are an organization that inspires young inner city kids to become the future tech entrepreneurs. And I think one of the things that I want to ask this group is to talk a little bit about what's happening or anybody that has an idea what's happening in terms of the um, social good enterprise or social good startups who are doing innovative stuff, creative stuff. In our cases, we have seven out of our Seven out of 10 kids, which 70% of our kids go and become engineers or become programmers, computer science engineers. Um, but there's no funding or, or, or kind of policy that helps those startups just because that doesn't exist in Washington. So if there's any policy, any ideas or any comments you guys have in terms of, of that industry that is innovating, disrupting, disrupting education, disrupting these other um, avenues. Great, thank you. Evan, do you want to say something about that? Um, Take your mic. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I think that the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always a little bit of a skeptic on the idea of social good startups. I mean, my view is if you're a startup, you're in it to make money. Um, if you have investors, you're in it to generate a return for your investors. Um, I'm fascinated by areas like education and health and, and, and energy and, and politics because I think they're really, really messed up, massive industries that present tremendous opportunity for disruption and therefore um, investment return. Um, you know, that's, that's my personal bias. With that being said, you know, I think that there's um, a tremendous opportunity to inspire um, a lot of the talent that we do have, particularly the younger talent, around those kinds of issues. Um, you know, when I spend time with a lot of the, um, you know, I'm, I'm 36, right? So I'm like right on that edge of not really a millennial, but um, still kind of able to relate to them. And when I, when I spend a lot of time with sort of my friends in their 20s and, and early 30s, right? These are, these are issues that they are um, very, very passionate about, that they care deeply about. Um, you know, we, we joke in Washington, right, that, you know, Washington has always been a city where inspired young people come to change the world. A lot of what we're trying to do is just get them to stop interning on the hill and start starting companies, right? Because that's where they have an awful lot more ability to actually make an impact in these areas. Um, you know, as we've seen, a lot of the challenges in identifying what the big issues are for Washington to solve, it's actually getting Washington to solve them, whereas, you know, going out and actually tackling these things as an entrepreneur may give you much more of a, a tangible ability to drive that change. Um, you know, and so that, you know, that to me is when I, the greatest inspiration I have for the future of our country is spending time with a lot of people in their late 20s who are trying to tackle these big problems in totally new ways, unencumbered by a lot of you know, preconceived thinking about um, the challenges the country is facing and, and aren't waiting around to sort of wait for Washington to make change, but rather trying to force the issue of, of um, having Washington react to them. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think you bring up a very, very good point. Um, and so the couple of examples that I'd like to point to, there is um, there's an organization out in Silicon Valley called, called Code 2040. And so it started by Tristan Walker, right? And so, and so I think you're going to start to see more organizations like this where he's, where he's bringing in um, tech entrepreneurs or tech students that are, that are from underrepresented groups and giving them exposure to Silicon Valley, giving them exposure to, to the startup space. And so I think when you start to see more of these kind of programs, you're going to start to change maybe the outlook and the exposure to this particular group. Um, and a couple of other points just to go along with it. If you look at a lot of tech-based startups, most of them don't have people that look like me. Um, African Americans represent probably about 10 to 12 percent of the national population. Um, in terms of VC-backed startups, we're about we're about one percent. So now that means that there's a tremendous opportunity to be able to expose a lot of underrepresented groups 
to the whole startup space because now that's going to change the economy. If you look at the city of Detroit, we're about 80% African American. If you look at the startup community there, it does not mirror that in any way, shape, form, or fashion. So what that means to me is that there's an opportunity. We can talk about the problems all day, but that means that there's an opportunity to be able to expose them. And I think the more that you expose other groups to it, then what happens is that now there's, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to be able to change the economic outcome of our society. Thank you. And unfortunately, we're, we're out of time now, so we have to stop there. But I want to uh, thank you all for your questions and your attention, and thank my excellent panelists for their insights. Thank you. Thank you.